ECU, Joe Walsh. Joe wrote that for us and when we began doing Ham Nation and uh, it's been kind of fun having him throughout all. I'm very honored to be here. This is my first time here and it's always been the deal that I couldn't make it. But we're here and I hope that we can I hope we can learn from each other because I certainly learn a lot from all of you. And we're going to run through a little bit of um, what's been going on and uh, how it happens with audio because audio unfortunately is kind of like put in the background and it should be something that we really pay attention to because most of the microphones that we use today are not made for ham radio. And I know what you're going to say, well, it's matching. No, that's only painted the same color. None of these manufacturers make their own microphones. They contract one of two companies in China, put their name on it, and they fooled you for decades. And you took it until this little freak from Southern Illinois came along about 1980 come off the rock and roll circuit and said, you know what, we got to do something about this. And I did. And it's been a really neat thing. There's all kinds of microphones out there. You've got dynamics, a copper wound, and uh, we probably made them as a kid. And then take a copper and wind it around a, a tube and put a magnet behind it and bingo, you have yourself a microphone. The electrics get a little crazier. They have a, an FET that powers the diaphragm and all this kind of stuff. And the condenser gets really uh, more involved. And then the ribbon. And, and these are all, uh, some of them, pretty exotic microphones. One of the most awful things that's happened to ham radio is condenser microphones. They shouldn't be used. They pick up everything. They have no pattern. And, and they're just awful, but, oh, I have a condenser. Well, good for you, but are you really listening to yourself? Most of you don't. You take some, some one of your friends, oh, it sounds okay, or they call you on the telephone and let you hear how you sound. That's not right. That's not right. But it happens. And we have to look at the most important is the frequency response, but what are we doing with it? The frequency response must be for your radio. I don't really care if a microphone does 22,000 cycles, but what we need to know is the important frequencies, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Proximity effects, very important. And when we got into this, and there's a long story involved in it, and it's, it's well documented, on our pages and stuff, but it was Joe Walsh that really helped me <clears throat> years ago, said, you got to build me a better microphone. And I had been building microphones before that for ham radio, but he said, we need one that I don't have to just stand in front of it. You've seen the, the singers, they got to be right here. Well, if they move off, they sound awful. Well, uh, pay attention to what's happening here. I'm 90 degrees off of this thing and it didn't change. That's very important. <clears throat> Proximity effect in the patterns, very simple. But it's extremely complicated to do. And we have our own pattern. We're in negotiations now to have a Heil pattern. I don't want choideoid. That's got a spike out the back. I don't want that. What I want is a pattern that has nothing out the back. So my blowers and all the room noise is gone, the television in the next room. And we do that. And we did it using antenna theory. Yes, we'll get into that a little bit. I had this 128 element, two meter array up in 1961, 62 in those years. The thing had a 24 dB front to back. And Joe had remembered that uh, we had worked when he'd come through town in his early days, and he said, make the microphone like that. Well, it's all about phasing, and we're gonna, we'll learn about that, but it's all about phasing in the pattern. When you turn that microphone backward, I wanna hear nothing, nothing. Try that with your microphone. You're gonna find out, oh, wait a minute. It still picks up the whole room. I don't want it to pick up the room. A rear rejection's important to us, and of course, as you know, uh, and we've just proved, they all pick up audio, but what are the patterns, the angles? 
and Omni is, is fine for, I don't know, if you wanted to record an orchestra maybe with one microphone. The cardioid, it's got stuff out the back. I don't want that. I don't want that. I learned years ago from a great mender of mine, Paul Klipsch. How many people know about Paul Klipsch? He was an amazing guy. He practically invented hi-fi. He invented the folded horn. He came to me, oh, this would have been about 1971, and uh, he called me and he said, I want to I see that 20,000 watt PA you built. He was mesmerized by that. And he taught me all these wonderful things, and I want you to go learn about this. Go look up Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson, the Fletcher-Munson curve in 1930s. What they discovered is our ears are not, they are not flat. A lot of people think they are. Look at your ears, what, look what's happening. The louder it gets, we're almost flat. That's why a lot of kids today like to listen to music real loud because it's almost flat. They can hear a lot of a lot of good things up there at that volume level, but it gets a little crazy. I want to see if this will work. I have a little demo here, and it all comes about when we listen to what our ears hear. What this is going to prove, this tone generator is absolutely same level. You can come up and look at the meter if you don't believe it. But as I go through these tones, notice some of them are louder than others. And it's not me doing it, it's your ears. Here we go. Here's a hundred cycles. There's 250. Here's 400. Here's 1K. Ah, wait a minute, come on here. Here's 1,500. And here's 2.5K. And we can go all the way up. And as we come back down the slide, along about 1,500 to 3,000, got pretty ruckus, didn't it? Well, now, wait a minute. That was all the same level. Uh, what's going on here? That, the telephone company put the telephone up and it was awful. They couldn't figure it out. Everything was flat all across America when they went from New York to California. They put Dr. Fletcher, Dr. Munson on the scene. They found out our ears are nowhere flat. So, then they went on and others really neat test and we could be here all day learning about how things work in our ears, but we are only interested in speech, articulation, articulation. I didn't hear that word in this industry until I came along. Microphone companies didn't talk about speech articulation. That is golden. Because if you have a big pile up, uh, the guy that is on top is the guy that's got his transmitter adjusted right. And thank goodness now we can shape the response because almost every transmitter has some form of equalization. In 19, it would have been 1980, I got back into ham radio. I'd been on the road for many years with these bands and I hadn't been on much. And I came in and everything was awful. I started listening and what did I hear? I heard stuff that sounded like this and I'm going, what kind of radio you got? Well, it's in my Kenwood. You're what? You're Kenwood with an MC50. Don't I sound great? And you think I'm kidding you. This is what it was. What happened to my great Collins audio. What happened to that articulation that Collins had? Well, it got destroyed. Why did it get destroyed? Because the imports, they hear differently from us. When we would take the who, we would take humble pie, whatever, into Japan with this 20,000 watt PA, we would have to totally re-equalize it. Why? Because they like things different and they actually hear differently. 
Americans here totally different. We, and so I, un, I understood what was happening then. So the first thing I did was that. That got me back into ham radio. How many guys had one of those? Anybody? It was a neat little gadget. The EQ200 that changed amateur radio. Because shortly after that, I had a guy from Japan, his name was Dr. Inouye, called me. He sent me a picture of his station and it had my EQ200 and my Goldline microphone. I'm going, whoa, this is the guy that owns ICOM. He wanted to know more about it. The outcome of that meeting was the Pro Series. I helped him understand that we needed two-band EQ. And so we helped him do that. And that brought equalization to it. Hasegawa then called me, I want to do better. So we did the parametric for them. The parametric's really cool because you can change all of the responses and stuff. But the problem you get there is you have to adjust it. But you want to listen to what Dr. Fletcher and Munson learned about our ears. And now we're able to tailor those things. And as you know, the, the, the microphones that we did uh, have tailored response, the HC4s and the 5s, and now the HC7. And the reason we're doing the 7 is that we now can adjust it. I, didn't, I don't want it all the way up in the top end. We want a little bit more mids, and we did that in the 7. Now you can really tailor it and make it even, even biteier than the 4. But you can't just you can't today, you just can't plug it in and say, okay, here it is. We've got to do a little tweaking because all these radios, every one of them, have some form of equalization. And uh, it was Walsh and I that figured it out. But the key was that rise from 2.4 to 5K. That's where all the articulation happens. And we want to make that in the microphone, and we did. The pattern was cool because, as you heard and uh, demonstrated, you only get things from the front, and it's totally omni on the front, nothing out the back. There's that antenna, 1961. Loving parents, my beloved parents. I was only 21 years old, and they allowed me to hire a crane and bring this thing in. I was the J-Beam company in England, and um, I, was an, I was a VHF nut. Because when I got involved in 1956, when VHF was really something, it, the bands were open all the time. I had a kilowatt, a single side band on two meters in 1958. I was one of the first guys in the country to do this because I, was, I learned this from a KMOX engineer in St. Louis. And I can't tell you how blessed I was. I met on six meters with him, and he taught me how to build this, this wonderful little radio, which was a transmitter, a 20A, built it from a kit, and then I built the transverter. 1959, I got a call from Bob Drake, and Bob says, uh, you the guy that's got that sideband rig on VHF? Yeah, he said, I want you to come out and talk to our club. We meet in the Biltmore Hotel once a year. It's called the Dayton Hamvention, downtown, 1959. That was amazing for this little teenage kid to walk in and see Bill Halligan and Wes Shum and Carl Mosley all in their different rooms. And here I was telling people how I built this thing. Well, anyway, it was the start of a great, great career. <laughs> uh, these are some of our, that's, a, that's how we get this, this rejection. And, this is probably going to be the most memorable thing of today. I have two microphones and they're exactly alike. Oh, wait a minute. One's white and one's red. <laughs> we have our own custom shop if you ever want to put your call in your microphone or paint it different colors, whatever. We do that in-house. There's a little side note to this demo. It's just a Y cable, two microphones, exactly alike, so they sound exactly alike. When I put them together, what are we going to get? 3 dB, right? I just went from 500 watts to 1,000 watts. Here we go. Might want to hold your ears, huh? Well, I'm not sure. Wait a minute. Listening is a mental process. Hearing, we just you've been hearing all morning. Let's listen. Play with me. Close your eyes, really. Now see if you can really, really detect 3 dB when I take it away. But listen. One, two, three.
two, three. I took it away. I'm going to bring it back. Here we go. One, two, three. No, you didn't hear it. Why? Because the human ear cannot detect 3 dB. When I get somewhere, oh, I can hear it. <laughs> okay, we're going to take you to the Smithsonian. <laughs> Here we go with this magic little plug. This magic little plug is wired backwards. It's out of phase. But it sounds just like this microphone. When I bring these two together, what am I going to get? Nothing. Nothing. Nada. Oh, boy. I wish we had about a day. This is my favorite subject. Do you know how your Yagi works? Do you know how, how West Shum got rid of the carrier? Do you know how he got rid of the other side bend? Do you know how your notch filter works? Do you know so many other things about your antenna system? I have a 40 and 80 meter phased arrays. That sounds like a big deal. No, it's a couple of wires with a phased line and I switch it in and out and I can go east or west and I get sometimes 20 dB on 75 meters. You know, no, that's not possible. Yeah, well, go look at program 6365 on Ham Nation. We prove it. I prove it every day and I'm amazed and I learned about it because of phasing. How does an equalizer work? How do you notch out the lows? How do you increase? It's all about phasing and Dang it, I don't see this on any of the test things. It's just crazy. I, I, they're not teaching us the right thing. A lot of political nonsense to get into this hobby. How, what about the real stuff that really means something? That's where I come from. And here's a, a thing that we do with this. We have a humbucking coil in some of the microphones. So if you pass it in front of monitors or some of the transformers, it's out of phase. That 60 cycle coil is wired out of phase, cuts it out. And it, these are all simple things that I learned. And I learned it from all my mentors. Transient responses, dynamic ranges. You don't ever hear about these things when you're reading specs. And the other thing is operating a microphone. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I hear a lot of guys, not, not particularly this cr crowd, but some of these guys, they back off from that microphone and they turn up that gain and boy, they just sound great, don't they? No, they don't. They sound like they're in a barrel. Yeah, but Harvey says I sound good. Well, good for Harvey. But I got to tell you, when you get up no more, than two inch, you got to stay into it. That's why you people are like booms, because it stays right with you. And you DX contesters have this fabulous dynamic range and incredible transient response. I listen to it all the time. I am just mesmerized by some of the great audio I have. Is it hi-fi? Hell no. Uh, is it really good? Oh no, but it certainly isn't bassy boomy with all the room noise. And that's what we have to listen to. Listen to our signal in another receiver. And we just, we're introducing this at this, at this show. This is the first product we've ever made with a 3D printer, uh, the original design. And it's a, got a boom, so it keeps the microphone right to you for all you desk lovers. And uh, when you push the push to talk switch, it lights up. <laughs> This was done by my crew. Uh, this was a, a really cool thing. We all worked on this and we worked on it hard and uh, we came up with a great product. But anyway, get back to my other here. You just have to be able to use a microphone properly. And you guys know how to do it. You know how it, how it works because if you get into that microphone, it just makes all the difference. And, and, and it, it depends on what you're doing, if you're doing rag chew or, or you're out in the contest world. Um, you you want to make sure you understand that ICOM is totally different. Their preamps of early ICOMs are down 15 dB, but most of you are using the new stuff, so that isn't really anything that you're going to use. We build a microphone that Dr. Inouye requested I did, and that works so good on all the icons, all of them, even the late models. And Ella Craftman, anything works on that little jewel. 
but uh, we're happy with, with our, uh, our dynamic microphones into it. And uh, if you do have an ICOM and you're going to plug a dynamic into it, you do have to decouple it. You guys all know about that. A lot of this stuff is not apropos to what you're doing. But there's one thing we want to talk about real quickly. Receive. Every transmitter or transceiver built has about a one watt at 10% distortion. You have never read a spec on audio amplifier outputs of your transceivers, have you? No, you haven't. Well, have you ever thought why? Because it's terrible. I could go out today, we could go to a truck, truck stop out here on 75 and buy a little Cobra CB for 39 bucks, and it's got a 7 watt at about 1 watt, or uh, 1% uh, 1 distortion, not 10. Why can't we have something better? Because we haven't screamed at them, we haven't done anything about it, we just took it. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's a new, uh, there's a new world out there for you. If you listen to speakers, and what'd you do? Well, hi, I bought a matching speaker. Yeah, you did. You got a 50 cent speaker. That's what's in there. I can prove it to you, every one of them. And you got a $100 box. It was painted the same color, so you have a matching speaker. Good for you. Oh, it looks really good. Well, but it doesn't sound very good. Well, it sounds good to me until. Here's the deal. You have a line output on every, rec every receiver out there. There's a line out. You go out and spend about 50 bucks. And like the old drunk said, I spill more than that. <laughs> and you buy one of these things. And I know, oh, I don't want to get involved. Well, you're, you're only going to use about three knobs on it. But it's the most important three knobs. I wish they only made a one channel. Buy this little mixer. What is it's a Behringer UB802. This little mixer, you come out of that line output and you take that into one of these line inputs. But now what do you do with it? Well, first of all, there's three band EQ. And we're gonna listen to some things in a minute. Show you how important three band, well, any kind of EQ is on receive. That's the key. Has to be on receive. And you, ha you can use your headphones out of it. It's a great headphone amp. I mean, really great. Because we're talking studio quality here, 0.1%. But these little speakers, and I did this purposely, I'm filling this room with these speakers. These speakers are $150 a pair. And they have two 35 watt amplifiers, 35 watt at 0.1% distortion. They're JBL near field control monitors that we use in the million dollar studios. They are something else. And uh, you can buy a subwoofer. Well, I don't need a subwoofer for what I'm using. Uh, in my own station, I have an, a 12 channel mixer and I have every one of my receivers. I have eight receivers in there plus other CD players and all that. And they all play through this. I never touch the audio uh, of the receiver. They always stay on and the audio is done with the mixer level. It's amazing because then you have this wonderful thing we call equalization. And let's see here. Let's get some stuff up here and uh, see what we can do to, to change some of this and uh, see if I can hear some things for you. Uh, let's see, I want to do this other one. Yeah, because this is going to have some good, good audio. I took this from, from the air and recorded it. And uh, I did this flat so that we're going to be able to hear uh, just what came out of that line output of my receiver. Okay, here we go. And I'll play with the EQ. I rolled off the low end. Now I'm going to put a little low end back in it and take out some of the noise. Delta. 
And you can hear how I got pulled that guy out of the noise a little bit. You now have all these things available to make some really cool things happen just by adjusting the equalization. And, and equalization is so important. So important. Uh, here's, a, here's an AM station. And uh, and then that's flat I can even make it sharper hurt your ears but I also can mellow it out you hear did that make sense to you you can understand equalization is so important but nobody talks about it and it's something that I wanted to really prove to you today how important that is and it's a JBL call it a control 2p that means power there's two 35 watt amplifiers in this guy and one of them feeds that speaker and the other one here it's just a miracle and and again it's very 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 inexpensive it's less than you spend for matching speakers but these are all important little facts that it, it, it all hinges upon your ears and that's that's what we try to do is to bring things into the into the industry that make sure we understand what's going on with these things one thing I, uh, I find a lot of guys always tell me, hey, your headsets are not very comfortable. Well, you have not read the instructions. <laughs> Every one we build has a steel band in it. So if it's uncomfortable, don't be afraid. If you have a big head, there you go. Got a pinhead like mine, make it work. I read these guys on uh, Eham. I read Eham every day. And if I see something that's not right, I'll come after you. Because you need to know. I don't come after you in a bad way. I'm always there to help you. But oh boy. Oh boy. But uh, we've, uh, we've got the new generation and we're very, very happy. We had a little hitch in the beginning of this thing because one of our stupid test jigs went nuts. But uh, this took me two years. There's a lot of copies of David Clark. And we have really done this thing right. And the one thing I want to tell you in closing, remember I told you about Paul Klipsch? Paul taught me how to tune speaker. We built thousands of speakers in the rock and roll days. He taught me how to tune speakers and cabinets. I always wanted to do this, but we never had enough room in the headset. Took the speaker after I found it. We had to go through and research the cone. Once I found the right 40 mil cone, I took it outside and did a free air cone resonance. What does that mean? I swept it and found out where that speaker resonated. Then the cavity, we coated the inside and we have some filler in there that tuned that cavity to that speaker. And that thing is wonderful. It has very low distortion. And, and, and that really bugs me. The people that build headsets, they don't give a damn about distortion. You know, oh, just a headset. No, but nobody's doing it. And I wanted to do this, and I did. And the thing sounds great. And of course, it has our exclusive phase reversal. And if you don't have one of our headsets with phase reversal, you're missing a whole platitude of what's out there because it it takes these signals and actually moves them around in your head when you reverse the phase of the speakers. It's really cool and uh, we're very excited about it. And the HC7, I'm really happy. Well, you, you heard Jerry from Navasa. The thing is really, really, really nice. And uh, it, it, it's, there's a whole new generation uh, for us. And um, they come in four colors. My wife owns Heil Sound. She took the company over about three, four years ago. I just invent stuff now. And <laughs> she, uh, she said, we need a pink headset. Well, guess what? We have a pink, a red, you name it. <laughs> but it's fun. We like to have fun. One of the things that we do is answer all of our questions and calls. So if you ever have anything, email. I, I answer about 200 emails a day. 
and I love talking to all of you and staying in touch I'm on the air a lot. Any questions we can go through quickly? Yes. Free air resonance. You take. What is the actual free air resonance of that driver you were talking about? Oh, that speaker's down around 80 cycles. And uh, it, it, the thing is, if you can tune the cavity to that, the speaker doesn't have to work very much. And we're not really interested in 80 cycles. That's about where I start the resonance of the speak of the uh, the whole uh, cavity. But the thing about that, if you don't pay attention to that, that speaker is just working like crazy and it, it, it distorts and that bugs me. Well, we don't have that problem with this. So that, that works really well. Thank you. Yes? Can you go into a little more detail about how you, I would like to hear how I sound on the radio. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little stumped about how I would figure out how my, how my mic works. Oh, it's pretty simple. You use a second receiver. And uh, don't tell me you don't have another receiver. You, uh, you, I know you tell your wife you only have one, but you got four, you got, you got four or five of them underneath the table here. And when she's over at the gym or something like that, pull one of those out, put a pair of headphones on it, stick a little wire in the back of it, and you're not going to blow it up. I use an 870 as my monitor receiver because it has a very nice flat receiver response. And that's what I use to re to, for all my listening tests. Uh, and transmit, go in a dummy load and uh, transmit. It's, it's great. And that way you will know, I know you're going to say, oh, that's not the way I sound. Well, yeah, right. But that's the way it is. <laughs> And you will know when you start changing the EQ, you will know when the sweet spot hits, just like what I'm doing here. The minute that I get to the sweet spot, you know it's going to happen. And you, whatever you like, you, uh, you nail it. Uh, there's a lot of mid-range, and sometimes that's handy and good to cut through. But a lot of times you smooth it out a little bit and you can just do all kinds of beautiful things with equalization. Don't be afraid of it. That's the problem. A lot of people are afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. Get in there and play with it. And uh, I don't like the processors because they usually cause a lot of distortion. They add a lot of gain, overdrive some of the other stages and I don't find many of those work well but some guys can get it if you know how to adjust them you're okay but usually equalization is much better to have EQ than it is to have processing but it sounds cool I got my processor on <laughs> somebody has something back there yeah yeah we, we yeah, well, we, we, we uh, gather that from the Million Dollar Recording Studios. You put them right here. They're like big headphones. And, and these big studios will have very expensive speakers up about that far from us on the ceiling. Uh, but we need headphones, but when we're, we need something close to our ears, but that's not good when we're operating a console. So we do mirror field monitors and the near field monitors they have a little shelf right and you look at studios and you'll see near field monitors are about right here either side they should be into your ear cavity not pointed in they're, they're just straight in and it makes a huge difference that's a, a great question thank you we just borrow it from the masters i mean we're not trying to defy science but there's not enough science told in the amateur radio market. Any more? Yes. Uh, you're talking about uh, our speaker amplifiers and our receivers having a distortion issue. Uh, if you're listening on headphones, obviously you need a lot less power. Does the distortion get much better at those lower power levels? You get much better at anything. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. It, it's The distortion really is evident when you don't hear it you're gonna say whoa look what I've been missing <laughs> great audio <laughs> and it's just so much better to have distortion free audio 
Well, I appreciate all of you coming. I know I've run over time. Thanks very much. Come by and see us. And uh, anytime I can help, please call. And uh, we're there to help you. We have a great crew back in Illinois where we build all of these things. One more? What? I'm sorry? No, but we're putting some of that up on this. We have a new website we're working on, and I'm just working on a whole new thing. So be watching the website. Okay, thanks, everybody.